Hi, I'm Barry Gilreath, your host for Fabric of Family. We have with us two guests who are going to help us discuss the subject of discouragement today. A very important subject that uh, all of us are affected by from time to time. And the men who are going to be assisting me with this discussion are Eddie Boggess. Eddie, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you, Barry. Uh, I am a minister for the Church of Christ in Lafayette, Georgia, and I've uh, been there for almost three years, and I have a wonderful wife, Karen, and two wonderful children, Bryson and Edison, and I'm just happy to be here and uh, encouraged to talk about discouragement. Okay. And in addition to Eddie, we have Heath Johnson with us. Heath? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Of course, I'm the minister with the Cold Springs Church of Christ in Pikeville, Tennessee. I'm a recent graduate of the Memphis School of Preaching, and it's very good to be back on the program with you, Barry. Thank both of you for being with us today. You know, as I was thinking about this subject of discouragement, there was one particular example that came to my mind about a man we read about in the Old Testament, a man by the name of Elijah. Elijah was a prophet of God. Uh, there were many remarkable traits that uh, we know that this man possessed. Uh, we think about Elijah and we think about his courage uh, when he withstood the false prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Uh, we think about his conviction. But something sometimes we may not associate with Elijah was discouragement. And I think it just goes to show us that even the best of us from time to time, we'll have to suffer or deal with discouragement in our lives. I'd like to begin our study today by asking you to uh, turn over to the book of 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19, and I would like for us to uh, maybe think about uh, how discouragement is destructive in our lives, and we're going to do that from the example of Elijah. Uh, Eddie, go ahead and start us off verses 1 through 5 and make any points or comments you would like along the way. Absolutely. And Elijah told, or excuse me, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then as he lay he and slept under the broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. I always find uh, this passage interesting. Uh, when I consider it because it demonstrates uh, so many important truths uh, about how we get discouraged and the times when we, when we get discouraged. Elijah was a man who was serving in a very discouraging time, uh, but he had up to this point done such an admirable job of uh, presenting the Lord's will to the people. That was a job of a prophet in those days. And uh, representing the Lord and teaching as the Lord would have him to. And he had just had uh, one of his greatest victories uh, just prior to these events on uh, Mount Carmel where he uh, stood against the prophets of Baal. And uh, In fact, it refers to that there in the first couple of verses where Ahab to, uh, informs Jezebel of how Elijah had destroyed the prophets of Baal. And Following that great victory, I'm, I can imagine that Elijah must have thought in his mind, you know, well, you know, it's all downhill from here. Uh, we've, we've conquered uh, the main enemy, uh, which is the false god of Baal. Uh, surely the people now will turn to the worship of Jehovah. Uh, surely now the king will change his ways. And then he hears from Jezebel, no, things have not changed. Those who are in power are still opposed to God's will. And so uh, he begins to feel discouraged and, 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 and continues on into the wilderness. And the point that I want to make about that is that it is so often when we have accomplished something great in our lives and then we're kind of brought back down to reality and we see, well, you know, at least from our perspective, that the thing that we have accomplished or that the Lord has done through our lives 
didn't have the effect that we thought it would or didn't do as much as we thought it would or, or uh, that there's still a lot of evil in the world and, and, and so uh, the, the impact that we thought we were going to have, we didn't have. And that, I think that's, uh, that is a source of discouragement many times in our lives uh, that uh, after we have a great victory, uh, we uh, begin to look around and we begin to see, you know, that maybe things aren't as great as we thought they were going to be and, and we fall off uh, down like uh, Elijah did. And you know, uh, something that uh, you read there in those verses that I, I really found so fascinating is that, uh, as you pointed out, Elijah, uh, just previous to this, had uh, demonstrated a great amount of courage. Mm -hmm. But yet we see in verses 2 to 3 that it only took the threats of one woman to send him running. Mm -hmm. And of course, this woman that is under consideration was Jezebel. And Jezebel was a very wicked woman, and she was a woman uh, who sat in a position of power and uh, could back up some threats that she would make and that she did make. And, and we see this, this brave, courageous man uh, just melting over the threats of this woman Jezebel. And this man who was once standing at Mount Carmel and uh, disputing the false prophets of Baal, now running, running for his very life. Heath, what about taking the next uh, five verses and uh, share with us any thoughts you have there as we continue this narrative uh, concerning Elijah the prophet. Okay, beginning back at verse 6, And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals, and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights into Horeb, the mount of God. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elisha? And he said, I have been very jealous of the Lord, the God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and even I, I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And, you know, as we find here, you know, I believe Brother Boggess made some very uh, good points there a few moments ago because, you know, those even people in great uh, positions of leadership for God can become extremely discouraged. And, you know, so we see Elijah doing this, but notice that the word of the Lord comes to Elijah. Elijah tells God, I, only I am left. And sometimes, you know, we can feel like we're the only ones who are left. Mm -hmm. We can feel like we're the only ones who are wanting to stand up for morality. We can feel like we're the only ones who are desiring to do right. And that can be discouraging. And so we see Elisha doing the same thing. He goes to this cave. He's seeking this solitude. He's eating. He's going 40 days and 40 nights. And here comes the Lord to him. And he's telling God, he says, God, I feel like I'm the only one that's left. And we can definitely feel that way at times. But, you know, I remember when I used to, in high school, there used to be a poster on the wall. And I always loved the quote on it. You know, it said to stand up for right even if you're the only one standing. And, you know, when we are discouraged, we have to look to God because it is God who can bring us out of discouragement. You know, even when it seems like everything's bleak, everything's down, everything's about to go, we always need to look to the Lord for, for our uh, encouragement. Absolutely. And, you know, as you were reading those verses, uh, I began to, to think about some of the uh, destructive aspects of discouragement. I think it might be profitable for us just to spend a few moments and maybe to uh, consider some of these. Eddie? Certainly. Uh, discouragement is so damaging in so many ways. Uh, it can, of course, cause us to feel bad. And uh, I think that, that in a nutshell, that's uh, what the problem is when it comes to discouragement. Uh, encouragement would be feeling good about what we are doing or about what's happening. Discouragement would be the opposite of that. It would be feeling bad or badly about uh, either what we're doing uh, or what uh, is going on in our lives. And so uh, certainly it's not an enjoyable thing to feel, uh, but it has some more tangible uh, damage that it causes in our lives. Uh, there are those uh, who, for whom discouragement can lead to more serious problems, uh, things like uh, depression and things like that, uh, that or, or can worsen those things. Uh, within the family, 
uh, we're talking uh, about the family on this program, uh, and that's the theme of this program. So uh, it, within the family, uh, it can certainly cause problems if uh, one particular person in the family becomes discouraged. Uh, it can drag the whole, the, the rest of the family down uh, with that person, especially if that uh, person is uh, uh, the father or the mother. They can uh, kind of just take the whole ship down with them. Uh, discouragement, cheap first and foremost, is dangerous to us because it stops our work, or at least slows it. Uh, if, you, uh, if you think about a, uh, someone who loves their job, whatever their job might be, uh, if they love their job and they enjoy doing what they do, they're going to put their very best into everything that they do. But if that, that love of their work begins to wane and they begin to feel negative things about what they're doing, uh, then they are going to put less effort into it or they may give up entirely. And uh, that often happens uh, to us, uh, uh, both within the family, as far as our working to be a good father or a good mother or husband or wife. It happens to us in our work for the Lord. Uh, if we become discouraged in that area, uh, we stop putting our best effort into it, or we may stop entirely. You know, I made a list of, of, of things that uh, discouragement does to us that's destructive. And I, I want to mention these, and you've touched on some of these already. And if you have any comments you'd like to make along the way, just feel free to interrupt me. Uh, discouragement leads to depression. Okay, we, we learned that from Elijah. Elijah was a depressed man. He was discouraged when he got that news that Jezebel was out to get him. It destroys our inner peace. You can't sleep well when you're discouraged. You, you don't feel good uh, about your life when you're suffering with discouragement. Discouragement will rob us of our faith. Now you think about Elijah. Could we make that association with him? How so? Well, because he was standing in such great faith there on Mount Carmel, uh, but when he received the discouraging message from Jezebel, uh, he uh, gave up on God, so to speak. Um, you might could say that he was seeking God and going to uh, Mount Horeb, which uh, would be Sinai, would be the mount where the uh, law was given. Uh, but that wasn't where God wanted him to be, as we see from the question that the Lord asks him in verse 9. Uh, he, he gave up. Uh, work and faith are so interconnected. Uh, we work because we believe. And so his abandoning the work illustrates that he uh, had, 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 to some degree or another, uh, lost faith in God's protection, God's desire for him to do what he was doing. And he got sidetracked. Mm -hmm. Uh, he got sidetracked from what his work was to be all about. Uh, he started feeling sorry for himself. You know, woe is me, here I am, you know, just trying to do what's right, and yet I'm having to, to run in fear of my life. You know, Barry, often when we go back in the first five, first five verses there, we also can see that a lot of times it just takes one person to say one thing to bring us down into discouragement. That's an excellent point. You know, I remember one time being told while in the Memphis School of Preaching by one of the instructors, you know, he says, many people can go by in the congregation telling you how good your sermon is, but that one criticism will be the one thing that you remember and the one thing you'll allow to discourage you. And you almost forget the 99% who told you that you did a good job and et cetera. But that's a thing that happens so many times. It just takes just a small one person and it can completely cause somebody to become discouraged and allow it to even to this. We're just talking about even to the point of us allowing it to affect our faith, affect our inner peace and things of that nature. That would certainly cause us to reconsider the things that we say to others. Uh, we were talking about the effects of discouragement, but if we think about the fact that uh, the way we human beings work is that, that one single thing can, uh, one, one negative statement can eliminate many, many positive statements and positive things uh, that happen to us. And so uh, within the family, uh, certainly we need to be careful what we say to each other uh, because uh, we are closest to those who are our family members, our, our wife or husband, our, our children or parents or whoever. And uh, uh, one thing that we say can, can really do some damage with someone else. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, I was thinking uh, about a... Uh, a situation that I observed, uh, it's been a long time ago, probably 20 years ago, but uh, I had a, a child at the time who was playing Little League Baseball. 
and uh, there was a game that was taking place and this little boy uh, was up at the, the plate and uh, he was doing his uh, dead level best to hit that ball and uh, he missed the ball every time and you could just tell that his uh, zest for life just I mean it sunk when uh, uh, when he missed that ball and he struck out once again he walks over <clears throat> to the dugout and then this big hawk of a man who was his daddy got out of the bleachers walked down onto the field picked that little boy up and shook him and said no son of mine will miss a ball hmm. and set him down and I can't help but think how that that little boy must have felt you know, um, all the encouragement his coaches could have given to him on that occasion or uh, his teammates to hang in there, all of that would have been just totally destroyed and wiped away by the discouragement that he got from his father. And, you know, talking about uh, the family, it is true that we need to think about these things when it comes to parenting. Uh, we want our children to excel, to do well. Uh, but at the same time, we need to understand that uh, the way in which we go about trying to help them to do that uh, can either be an encouragement to them or it can be discouragement to them. And I think in the example that I brought for your attention uh, is an example of a discouraging way to handle uh, a situation. Yeah, you know, as we was talking about that once again, you know, oftentimes it's the people who are the closest to us whose discouraging comments can be the most discouraging. You know, talking about that, I remember one time when I was in high school, I remember I had a good friend who made an A on his report card and he ran to his father, or elementary school, excuse me, and he ran to his father and he's out in the parking lot and he said, look, Dad, I made an A. Mm. And the father said, well, why didn't you make two? Mm. And that son became so discouraged and so upset. And you know, we gotta realize, you know, that you know, discouragement is something that comes to everybody in life. There's gonna be a time when everybody's discouraged. It's universal. It but is. You, but you know, as members of the body of Christ, as family members, we need to strive to encourage one another. That needs to be a goal that we should all have. You know, discouragement's going to come, but you know, we need to look to God. We need to look to our families. We need to look to God's Word for encouragement to help one another. That's part of the reason of the church is edification of the saints, encouragement of one another. Absolutely. And, and you know, uh, I, I want this program today uh, to, to be very practical. And, and I think we've offered a lot of good practical advice. But in the moments that we have left, I'd like for us to maybe offer some suggestions to someone who may be watching the program who uh, are struggling with discouragement, some things perhaps that they could do to help them to overcome this. Eddie? Certainly. I think that overcoming discouragement, and we can see this uh, in part by looking at Elijah, uh, overcoming discouragement is all about perspective and priorities. It's about perspective in that we become discouraged when we're looking at the trees and missing the forest. We become discouraged in large part, not maybe not in every case, but in large part when we're, when we're focused on one bad thing. And what we really need to do is see all the good that's out there. Yeah. Uh, and recognize that there's a lot of good going on. And, that, and that's what God showed Elijah is that, you know, I'm still in charge. My power is still there. Uh, I still have others with you, as yeah. he points out down at the end of the, of the thing there. And then, and then priorities, uh, we have to remember that there is value in doing the Lord's work, whether we see it or not. And we have to focus on doing what the Lord tells us to do first. And I, that's some excellent advice. You know, we, we need to be aware of those things. And, and remember also that the trials that we are going through, there, there are others who have gone through those things. Sometimes we may tend to think we're the only one who's ever had to deal with this. That's not the case. But we do need uh, good companionship. Uh, good companionship can it encourage us when we're discouraged. I want to say that you have been an encouragement to me today for being on this program. And I hope that the things we've talked about today are going to help others. Who, who are perhaps struggling with discouragement in their life. Until next time, I'm Barry Gilreath. Have a great day.
One. Speech on. Timer. Selected. Screen recording.